Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report, episode 338. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, for the, uh, joining me as usual cast of characters, Gail from um, Community Digital News, um, NY Fights, as well as the Falcon Valley Group, Daniel from the Inscriber and Four Boxing News. What's going on, lady and gent? You could just say usual cast of characters and move on. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, for those who look, uh, yes, I know we're kind of fluid here in terms of the nights that we record. So we're doing this live on the Thursday for those who want to uh, check out some boxing talk and don't have their eyes on the um, on the NFL, on the uh, Cowboys Buccaneers games. Very good game, by the way. Um, those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report live YouTube show podcast as well as site discussing all things boxing. Uh, the motto is with Mox is good, we will talk about it. And when it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line, if it concerns if it concerns the sweet science, it will get talked about. If, if you want to find more information on the show, please go to this website. Excuse me, some technical difficulties here. Please go to the website p4pboxingreport.com. I'm going to repeat that p4pboxingreport.com. On the site, you'll find information you want to find us all over the podcast realm, be it Spotify, be it Anchor, be it um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, TV, and everything in between. We're just about all over the, we're just about everywhere now on the podcast platforms. Uh, you can also find links to where to find us on social media Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr, Instagram, and Facebook is shaky right now, but we're technically still up. Uh, where you can also have links to where you can donate, Cash Me PayPal donation link. If you want to email the show, you can do so, p4pboxing at p4pboxingreport.com. Last but certainly not least, um, I know we're towards the end of the summer, getting into the fall, but if you're still looking to get yourself in shape, uh, um, if you're looking to take part in a fun um, but yet challenging fitness group, group fitness challenge, or if you're interested in anything concerning beach body or beach body on demand, please check out my coaching page. I am an online coach for Beachbody.com. Take advantage of the two-week trial. Uh, for two weeks, uh, you get the option of having free access to all programs on Beachbody on demand, be it be it Bar Blend, Pio, Morning Meltdown, which the ladies really like. Um, six weeks of the work was a really challenging workout. Uh, the old school P90X series, one, two, three. The Insanity, the Insanity Asylum series, or if you're looking for a, a program specifically based, based around the sweet science, uh, please check out 10 Rounds. That is a six-week program consisting of uh, five workouts in a, a per week, uh, two, three days of uh, boxing-based cardio, two days of weightlifting. Um, I've done it a few times. I'm on a, a hybrid program of that right now. Um, it's very, very good, very, very interesting. I think it's worth your while to check that out even just use uh take advantage of the two-week trial so yeah uh check out um all the programs and take advantage of that two-week trial um on my online coaching link on pound for pound box report website let's get things going in everyone let's recap what went down over the weekend let's start in the uk uh we went into this a lot last week um this particular fight we're getting ready to talk about that is the rematch between mauricio laura and josh warrington um they fought uh, this they fought in March, right? Warrington had given up his IBF belt at 126 pounds. Decided just to take a fight to stay busy and, if anything, just set up some uh, potential fights down the road against a pretty much little known Mexican, unknown, unheralded Mexican by the name of Laura. Well, to his surprise, Laura not only got, I mean, Warrington, excuse me, not only did not get, did he get beat, he got beat up, stopped at nine. Um, they fought the rematch uh, this past weekend in the UK in Warrington's hometown. And while I wasn't able to see the fight, I heard a lot about it. And I'll go to you on this one, Gail. Ladies first, as always. Um, from what I've read on uh, the social media uh, 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 platforms, particularly boxing Twitter, was um, the one consensus was disappointed. The fight ended in two rounds due to a uh, uh, cut as a result of a nasty head gash um, the majority of comments that i read was that the fight was beginning to play out in the same way their first fight did right um and 
there were more than a few folks who claimed that the headbutt was purposely done by Warrington. Um, you watched the fight live, Gail. Uh, was that kind of, was that your general thought of what, of how the fight went down? Like everybody, I was so disappointed to see this happen. And, but there was no question that once it did happen, the fight needed to be over. Nobody argues about that. It was the right outcome given the circumstances. The cut was bad. It was in a horrible place. It was pretty much from end to end across Laura's eye. And unfortunately, it's the kind of cut that's going to take a long time to heal. So we were all teed up. We were expecting a barn burner. Warrington was clearly far better prepared. Even from two rounds, you could see he wasn't blowing Laura off like he did the first time. But Laura was giving him a lot to handle. So whether Warrington would have prevailed, you know, I saw a closer fight, but Laura still taking it probably a late round stoppage. But we'll never know. And we aren't going to know anytime soon. There is no way Laura is going to get back in that ring for months. And Warrington can't sit on his butt for all that time. You know, he walked away, you know, pretty much unhurt, untested, barely cracked a sweat. Really, he could easily take another fight after a little bit of a layoff, just a few more weeks tuning back up. He'd be ready. He could have another fight in two, three months, easily before the end of the year. And apparently Eddie Hearn, according to Warrington, is talking about teeing up Leo, Leo Santa Cruz. That's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and I have no problem at all, Warrington, you know, going ahead with another fight. He can't just sit around on the shelf waiting for Laura. For, for Warrington's part, he's now sort of saying, oh, you know, I'm kind of done with this. And, um, it was interesting to me that all of a sudden he's not all that interested anymore. I think he was getting all he could handle from Laura, even that early in the fight. I do not, however, buy into any of the conspiracy theories that, of course, immediately started that Laura did it on purpose to make sure he got himself out of the fight. Not buying it. It looked clearly like a mistake. And, hey, if you're the guy... Uh, delivering the headbutt, you know, there's just as much chance you get hurt too. So if there was even the one tenth of one tenth of one percent of a chance that he did that, it's just pretty damn stupid. I, I just don't think that's the case. But what a letdown. It was going to be, in theory, the biggest fight of the weekend and you didn't get to see it. I'll go to you, Daniel, if you were able to see the fight. Uh, disappointing, um, let down in Gail's words. Um, if you were, if you were Hearn, right, his promoter, Warrington's promoter, and others in, in Warrington's camp, what do you think he should do? I personally think, yes, this was inconclusive, but I don't know if we will see a third fight between these two um, based on his last, based on this fight and the previous fight. I don't know if Warrenson has it anymore. Is he done? That's the question of it because even though we only saw five minutes of it, the same story was starting to be told where it was starting to look even a little bit. Warrington was landing his shots, but Laura was starting to land more of his. And they were varying more. So it would have probably wound up in the same result. And it happens. A lot of... There's just sometimes a fighter that has your number. No matter like how good you are, what position you are, you know a fighter has your number. Uh, I'll always point out to the great Johnny Tapia. He, he always had that guy, Pari Ayala, who he just couldn't beat. And that could be what's this instance when it comes to Warrington. Maybe against another opponent, he looks good, but he probably doesn't. He just can't 
seem to solve this puzzle with Laura for the time being, but what sh should probably encourage the team when it comes to Warrington is you can look at another situation where you had a fight stopped early due to injury and the results went a little bit in your favor. And like I said, talking about that, the fight we saw recently with the Maloney brothers. And Joshua Franco. We saw that the second fight, similar circumstances. Not so much, a, not that bad of a cut. That cut was nasty, but similar injury, stopping the fight early on. And, but at that point, Franco wasn't looking as good as he was with Maloney. But then in the third fight, we all saw that he came fully prepared. Maybe in the sisters, Warrington can adjust and maybe do something fares a little bit better. But I don't think I don't think they're gonna they're gonna get to it because there's not much room when it comes to Warrington. Go to one thirty, you're gonna face guys that are when they're stronger, and you know you can't cut down to one twenty six. So nobody knows what's gonna happen in that area because if they're gonna do the rematch, they have to wait for that eye to heal, and we don't know how long it's gonna take. I uh, want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Sean and Lee for joining us in the live uh, uh, YouTube chat. I want to read a comment from Lee here. Uh, Lee Groves, uh, the easiest fight that could be made for Warrington is Kid Galahad, now IBF champ. But Warrington gave up the IBF title when Galahad, who he already beat by ugly split decision, was made his mandatory. True. Uh, um, the problem, my problem is Lee. And you can chime in, uh, uh, Gail and Daniel, if you want. One, I felt that Galahad beat Warrens in that fight. It was an ugly fight in part because that's how Galahad wanted to make that, wanted it. He won a slow paced fight. Uh, uh, he nullified the, the, the energetic style of Warrens, right? I think Galahad has improved since that fight or if not stayed the same, Warrington has uh, 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 digressed. I don't think it may be the easiest fight, quote, unquote, on paper, uh, but I feel that if they were to fight now, Galahad would beat him. So to Daniel's point, it's a tricky situation uh, in terms of where he goes. In terms of Lara, um, ooh, him and Leo Santa Cruz, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Uh, Santa Cruz has been fighting at 130 and 135 even um, over the past two years. Over the past years, I wonder if he can, how comfortably he can get down to 126 pounds. But if they do, that's an entertaining fight. And I wouldn't automatically make uh, uh, Santa Cruz the favorite either. I just put that out there for a record. So I uh, also want to give a shout out to Lisa. Uh, a shout out. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Uh, um, Oh, Lee says he let me add another comment from Lee. He says, I mean the e when he terms about easiest, he means meant the easiest to arrange, not the easiest to fight. Thanks for that clarification. Um, yeah, easiest to easiest to arrange, but still, I think that uh Galahad would beat him. And I don't know if Warrington would want that rematch uh, uh at this point. Uh, let's move on to uh, and Lisa also says hello to you um, as well, uh, Gail and Daniel. Let's move on to some other fights here. Going back to you, Gail, undercard of that rematch, you had Katie Taylor, women's undisputed lightweight champion, uh, defending her belt against Jennifer Hahn. Again, I wasn't able to see that fight. I, was, I had to work. But from what I read, uh, Taylor won, had her way. I believe she scored a knockdown in that fight. Look, last week we talked about Amanda Serrano a lot uh in her win and my argument is and i wrote about this for three kings boxing uh please check out three kings boxing.com your latest for uh for for boxing information my argument is serrano and taylor need to fight after this win by taylor um i think it's even more the case uh these two should be on the collision course to fight each other 
it's arguably uh, uh, the best matchup that could be made right now. Uh, why is it happen? Why has it not happened yet, Gil? And is there any indica indication from your uh, from your reading between the tea leaves and, and from your context that we're close or any movement towards making this fight a reality? Well, there are two ways to look at it. Serrano's uh, version of the story is that she wants to unify first, and she's close to doing so. That, to me, is the biggest accomplishment in boxing, biggest true accomplishment in the four belt era to unify a division. That's your ticket into the Hall of Fame. No question about it. The fight with Taylor is kind of a different issue. You're right. It's a big money fight. It's a big name fight. Um, Serrano has been a master of going up and down weight divisions. It's kind of amazing. You know, Pacquiao fought his way through eight weight divisions as champion, going up slowly but surely. Um, and a lot of us would argue that he's never really been a welterweight. I mean, he just but so talented he was able to compete at welterweight that is not his natural upper weight but serrano has done it virtually simultaneously back and forth i mean at one point she dropped down to 115. it's beyond me how she could do it and a lot of people would love to know her secrets to doing so including a lot of the guys um but nevertheless talent aside going up to face taylor would be Oh, that's a lot to chew. That is a lot. Nevertheless, if she can get her division unified and then go forward with that fight, you know, she has something to rest her reputation on that can never be taken away from her. It's solid. It's there. And maybe psychologically, it puts her on a little more even footing in her mind. There's also another reason she might be wanting to do that. Taylor has a lot of mileage on her from the amateurs and now as a professional. Um, she is, I believe, 37 years old. It's hard to believe that she's been around that long. And for many of us, you know, a lot of her amateur career got by um, folks. You know, they're only now getting to know her. Um, you know, I take that back. She is 35, so she's not, not quite as old as I'm making her out to be. But it doesn't hurt uh, Serrano to take a book out of plenty of other male boxers who've waited out their rivals to let them get a little more age on them. And I know Serrano's the younger. I believe she is 32, but she also has a lot fewer rounds. So mileage wise, um, she's in a strong position either way. So, it, you know, it could be that. And there's the whole idea of let's build it up. You know, the um, pandemic is still getting a say. We don't know what's going to happen this fall. This is a fight where you want a full house. And man, it is rare to have a women's fight so anticipated that it would fill an arena. And it absolutely would jam virtually any venue short of Wembley in the UK if it was to be held there, particularly if it was to be held on Taylor's home turf. If you saw the card this weekend, those fans in Leeds where the fight was held, you know, I mean, she wasn't even in Ireland and that place was going nuts. Those fans were into the entire card start to finish. They were there for it. What a shame that they didn't get to see Warrington, uh, Warrington and Laura pay off, but they did get to see Taylor and Han for their trouble. Um, credit to Han, she never gave up. She kept coming. She'd been out of the ring a long time. She did not embarrass herself. She also was coming up a weight division, but the fact is she'd been out of the ring two years. She'd had a child in between, um, but you know, credit to her. She got in shape, she made weight. She put her best effort in. There was no official knockdown call. It was sort of uh, questionable whether it was or wasn't. Um, but the truth is, although it was a 
virtual shutout. I believe it was a shutout on two of the three cards for Taylor. You know, it's one of those fights where every round was won by Taylor, but some closer than others. But you only have to win each round 51% to 49% in a judge's mind. And at the end of the fight, it isn't that it's averaged out to be this fighter won 50 one percent of the time it ends up being it's a complete blowout if they won every round that this fight was really a good illustration of that han wasn't blown out as badly as the scores look yes she clearly lost but credit to her for giving it her absolute best um indeed uh i want to give a shout out to what you need also, uh, uh, who's joined us live in the chat. Um, I want to um, send a question here uh, from Lisa that whoever wants to answer, please do. She asked in the um, chat, what is the biggest fight, Shields versus Marshall or Taylor? Uh, yeah, Shields versus Marshall or Taylor versus Serrano. Anybody wants to uh, tackle that question? Uh, Taylor versus Serrano right now, just because of the international factor. Like, you could you could put that fight in there. In Belfast, you could put the fight in the UK and it will sell out shields. It depends on where it is. If it's in the Midwest, Michigan, Detroit area, you have a chance. But outside of that area, then no. Like with this thing, like I mentioned the UK with Taylor, you could take this fight to New York and the Ricans will show up. Especially since we since we have to be vaccinated to get into the arenas. <laughs> well, so, there was about putting um, Taylor Serrano in the little theater, uh, the now the Hulu theater at Madison Square Garden. Um, and it absolutely would be a crazy atmosphere. All the Irish will travel, plus all of the Irish affiliated New Yorkers, plus all of the Puerto Rican supporters who would come out for Serrano would be a lot of fun. But you know, that theater isn't that big. Whether they could fill the big room, eh, that'd be tougher. But anywhere across Great Britain, this would be a massive, massive event. And I don't think Serrano would have any trouble traveling. Um, going to you, uh, Daniel, in terms of this, Lisa's question kind of um, uh, touched around uh, the, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm about to ask here. Um, no problem, Lisa, no problem. Um, Shields, and, and this is kind of going into Shields a bit, going to try to connect the, her question into this discussion about uh, uh, Taylor and Serrano, right? Over the past week, Shields has signed a deal with Sky, uh, right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of rumblings that, her, that the fight between Shields and Marshall is going to happen um, at some point in 2022. Uh, Shields has another MMA fight, I think, later on this year. Um, that's the second of her two-fight deal, right, going into MMA. But all indications are now, Daniel, that we will see a Shields uh, Savannah Marshall showdown at 160 pounds uh, um, first half of next year. Now, bring it back to uh, Taylor and Serrano. Serrano specifically, does she have to sign some kind of sip? I don't know her exact specific promotional, managerial, uh, financial issue matters right now, but does she have to sign some kind of specific, similar type of deal in order to make or help make a fight um, against T Katie Taylor? Not necessarily, because she has claimed as recently, I think it's this week, or late last week that she views Eddie Hearn as her promoter. So if you can normally, like it's the same thing that Lee mentioned, Lee brought up with Ga Galahad and Warrington. If you're technically within the same promoter, it should be easier to make. The situation is when it comes to Serrano is the money. She understands that uh, she understands that she's not going to get a side money, especially in the UK against Taylor. You can have that battle 
if if Taylor's going to come to the U.S. But if you're in the U.K., you're not going to get the A-side money. But she wants to be paid enough of an amount where it has a feel of, the, of a big fight thing. And like we mentioned, you mentioned it with S.H.I.E.L.D., she's going to do MMA. Serrano already does MMA and has said that if boxing doesn't pay, she's willing to go MMA full-time. So that's the main factor that makes this situation with Taylor interesting because if it wasn't that, if it was from a personal standpoint, this fight would have been done already. Because that animosity that Serrano has for Taylor is personal. <laughs> And I can, and I understand that you beat up your little you beat up my little sister. I you may have to see me if I if I was the big sister that I completely get it. So that's that's the part that's going into it. I don't think she needs to sign the Sky Sports deal because it depends on where it goes. It depends on unfortunately how far along we're in this pandemic in twenty twenty two. If we're still dealing with this in 2022, and if the UK deals it with worse, because they're off and off in a lot of things, you may have to put this fight in the US. And then, like I said, that puts Serrano on even ground. But you're going to have that argument, though, that Taylor's still technically the A side at that point. Yeah, the beef between uh, Shields and Savannah and Marshall is real. Uh, not as much in, in, on the other way around with Cup. Serrano and, and Taylor, for those who don't know, um, Marshall is the only woman to beat Shields pro or amateur. Um, but the bad blood online has been has been heated uh, for sure. Uh, Shields now has said that the two ladies sparred and that um, she had her way with Savannah Marshall. Savannah Marshall says that um, it wouldn't matter if it's a boxing ring or MMA ring. She's beating Clarissa Shields' ass. Um, but I uh, tend to agree with you, Daniel, um, while Shields is considered the quote, quote, unquote, Taylor Serrano is the, is the bigger fight he has to, is also potentially the highest grossing fight, uh, because of the aspect of Hearn and, and, and match room and, and what Taylor as what Taylor has with both ladies has done, um, Shields may be undisputed in two divisions, but could it be argued that Serrano has accomplished more by winning seven by winning a world title in seven different divisions? Could it be argued that Taylor's undisputed is more legit than either of Shields' undisputed titles at 154 and a, at at either at 154 or 160 because if we're going to be honest here some of those titles were given to shields by proxy right fought for vacant titles and whatnot while, while taylor she put it this way taylor beat the more legit women to become undisputed right i will say that on the record and and so yeah yeah that's why i would put Taylor Serrano as as the bigger fight, but hopefully it can happen. Hopefully all parties can come together. Um, Eddie Hearn can work his magic behind the scenes. Lou DeBella as well, and 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 we can see something in um, twenty twenty two. That is the fight as far as I'm concerned. Shields and Marshall is too, but 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 um, Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. At, at 135 for the undisputed women's lightweight titles. That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous, that's a high profile mega fight when it comes to women's boxing. I'm gonna ask this beforehand. Did any of you guys see the Kazuta Ioka Francisco Rodriguez Jr. fight that took place in Japan? If not, I can just uh, do a dolo. Let go right ahead, but yes, I did wake the F up at that ungodly hour and watch that thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. I unfortunately my alarm didn't go off, so go ahead. Yeah, they fought over in Japan. They fought over in Japan. Ayoko putting his WBO 115 pound strap on the line against mandatory contender uh, Rodriguez, third straight mandatory for the champ. And 
I will say that if Ioka's previous fight win over Kosei Tanaka, stoppage win over Kosei Tanaka, if that's considered his best performance, and many people do consider his best that the best performance of his career, this one, yeah, not so much. He won, and he won by unanimous decision, 16-12 on all score four, four scorecards. But Rodriguez, for good chunks of this fight, made um, Ioka work. He was in his face throughout most of the fight on the front foot, right? Uh, pressuring him with shots to the head and body. And at times, uh, Gail, he did a good job of countering Ioka's counters. The problem was that Ioka is one of the slickest fighters in the game, uh, one of the highest boxing IQs in the game. And over time, you could see him adjust and separate himself with the feet in terms of feet, foot positioning, in terms of what uh, his distribution of punches um, begin to get the jab off more, begin to work the body of Rodriguez himself and did a better overall job of, of, of pot shotting. Rodriguez threw more, it can be argued, but the champion threw what he was more accurate. And I think that accuracy and the adjustments that he made over the second half of the fight, uh, uh, that was the difference. Um, I will go to on this one, Gail, in terms of post-fight. I'm hearing rumblings of that Ioka wants uh, uh, to fight in engage in a unification bout against German Akahas, IBF champion. Um, have you heard anything about that? I've heard the same talk you have, nothing on the books. I like that fight. I like the rivalry. I like the Japan versus the Philippines. Um, I think it will be competitive. I would favor Ioka in that fight, but I think Ancajas will give him a very good fight, and Rodriguez gave him a very good fight. But Ioka is like one of those artificial intelligence you know, androids in a science fiction movie who takes a few shots and then adjusts the shield and then takes a few more hits and adjusts again. And where Ioka improved his performance from round one to round 12, Rodriguez didn't improve. He did very well. He was competitive throughout. He had a chance till the very end, but he didn't improve. He didn't adjust in the same way. Ioka is just surgical that way. It's very subtle and it's really great to watch, especially for real hardcores who know what they're watching. It's impressive. And it is worth getting up in the middle of the night on the West Coast to see. <laughs> Indeed. One more comment in terms of the previous discussion we had vis a vis Serrano and Taylor. Lee says in the chat that not only that, Serrano won a belt at 140. Then just 132 days later, captured a belt at 115 pounds in just 35 seconds. Um, unprecedented. Though I will say, Lee, um, it can be argued that belt, that that title she won at 115, uh, yeah, over far, well overmatched opponent. And some would argue that she was a, being guilty of weight bully. But still, um, I see your point. I, I, I acknowledge your point in terms of what Serrano did. Uh, and it's really astonishing, amazing that she was able to drop uh, that much weight uh, in basically a little over four months, a little over four, four, four and a half month period to go from 140 down to 115 pounds, make the weight and win the world title. So indeed, uh, that is true. Let's move on to um, one more fight. Took place on Sunday. I'm going to you on this one, Daniel. Um Young 20-year-old kid from Arizona by the name of Jesus Ramos. Jesus Ramos. He stepped into a ring against a tough, experienced guy by the name of Brian Mendoza. Mendoza was uh, set to fight uh, J-Rock Williams. The fight was uh, postponed, was canceled, I should say, due to an injury suffered by J-Rock. And basically, Mendoza was like, okay, I want a, I want a main event fight. Um, Ramos, who fought most of his career at 40 and 47, um, he took the he um took the opportunity to also be in a showcase uh, uh a main event uh show main event card on PBC and they fought at 154 pounds right well I watched this fight I did the recap for it, uh for Three Kings Boxing and 
I have to say, uh, we talk a lot about Virgil Ortiz Jr., about Boots Ennis at 147 pounds, right? Um, Rashidi Ellis, insiders know about him as well. I think it's high time we put this 20-year-old kid Ramos in that mix. Um, I was very impressed by him, um, Southpaw, uh, even though he was moving up and fighting at 154 for the first time. He looked just as big as the natural junior middleweight Mendoza, and as the fight went along, it wasn't uh, – he proved to be the stronger and more powerful man. But the thing that I was like – that was eye-catching to me, his skill and his ring intelligence. For someone so young, he's very smart. and He was very slick. Mendoza was trying to stay on the outside and basically try to uh, 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 trick and not fox him trick and put use his feet to put him in positions where he could land a punch. But over time, as the fight went along, Ramos flipped the script on him. And in the end, he dominated. That was a 12-15 round fight. He might have stopped Mendoza. Uh, your thoughts on it? Um, I came away. I'm okay. I'm like, okay, this this little this young kid has a future. He does. Like I said, he's very, very young. And you can obviously tell that he's still growing into it. It's the main reason why he looked so natural, even though he's been fighting that welter. He looks natural at junior middleweight. So you could tell he's going to be growing into it. He probably might wind up before it's said and done to have his career over at light heavyweight, the way it looks. And he was patient. Like I said, he didn't try to do too much, but he did enough to completely dominate the fight from a ring generalship standpoint landing standpoint from power standpoint the main thing you probably needs to work on and we kind of understand he's still a very young person is noticing when you can have the guy hurt to the body because he, he had mendoza hurt with some body shots in the middle rounds and as you look as you go along you you'll probably learn then when you can see when to finish but as far as this, this was a good performance. And this is, could be a performance that has his team maybe think about keeping him at junior middleweight because for you know, for a young person, like if they, that to try to cut down so much weight when they don't need to, it's actually beneficial just moving up even at this stage. So this could be, yeah, this could be the beginning of seeing Ramos in those rate divisions, 154, 160. Like I said before, I would have surprised my fiance that light heavyweight. And actually, I, I interviewed, I, I did an interview, I interviewed him earlier today uh, as myself as well, and um, had a meeting relations for uh, Three Kings Boxing, uh, a previous guest on Pound for Pound Boxing report numerous times over, uh, uh, Bo. And um, humble kid, right? Um, I asked him about him wanting to fight J Rock now since uh, he's beat Mendoza, who was set, who was set to fight J Rock. He says he's not against it. In terms of your questions about your comments about him, one fifty four, one forty seven, he says that he was testing the waters at one fifty four, and he suggests that he's unsure of what he wants to do. He has to talk with his uh, his team. His dad, who's his trainer, as well as his uh, 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 managers and promoters, uh, he did concede that 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 147, he could make the weight. But he, like you, Daniel, he he also said that he could uh, he can also see himself uh, uh, in the future fighting at 100 and, and 154. I personally think he looked because he looked good, he looked comfortable. In this fight against Mendoza, I think he should. I think his camp should have him staying up there. Uh, he's going to outgrow that division soon. He's only twenty, and his body. Uh, he was big in this fight, but you can tell his body is not mature. He hasn't got his man body yet. He hasn't got his man muscle. Uh, but it's the skill uh, more than anything that coupled with the fact that he can punch. Uh, he's good to the head and the body. I think certainly. Uh, um, if you hadn't heard of him now, um, keep an eye on this dude. Uh, keep an eye on the interview that I did uh, for Three Kings Boxing. You can find that 
uh, video of that on Three Kings Boxing uh, Facebook page. Uh, yeah, he's one to watch. He's He is one to watch uh, for sure. Let's move on to um, some news here. Uh, going back to you, Gail, it looks like we're finally going to, we have a date for Teofimo and Cambosas. Uh, give us some insight for those, give some details, I should say, for those uh, uh, who are not familiar with the story. Give an update, please. Well, they have finally got signatures on paper. That's when it's time to talk about things being real. So they have both signed both camps, and the new date is October 4th in New York. Um, and October 4th, interesting choice of dates. That is a, I'm going to just double check my calendar to give away all the accurate information. Um, are you sure you've got this? That's on a Monday, okay. right? Yeah, it's a Tuesday. I believe it's October a Tuesday. 5th is the day. It's a Tuesday fight. Um, oh, it's on the 5th. My bad. My apologies. I'll yeah, fix that. Yeah, well, I'm um, looking at our written show. docket, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I'm, I'm saying that. So, um, interesting choice. You know what? No, I take it back. It is the 4th. It is the 4th. A Monday night fight. Well, part of it is a, a lot of the weekends are filled up assuming they don't all get canceled because of COVID injuries, drug tests. I mean, the boxing schedule for the back half of 2021 has been completely Swiss cheese. If you like Swiss cheese, you're happy. The rest of us losing fights right and left. So at least this one's back on the schedule. Um, and apparently nobody thinks it's going to compete with football that night. Um, huh? But it but if you okay. do it on the but if you do it on the weekend, it certainly will. I mean, it's just messy, and I think everybody involved is just so darn tired, you know, at the path this has taken. They're just worn out, so they've decided, heck with it. Let's get it on the schedule. Let's get it over with. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of where it goes. Um, it's almost an obligation at this point. It is going to be in the small theater, again, the Hulu theater at Madison Square Garden, not the big room. Um, I think that's a smart thing to do um, in, is to get a full house, kind of, you know, lower the expectations just a little bit. Um, I'm sure they could get 10,000 in the main, um, the main room, but it would feel empty. So this is a good thing to do. Yeah, I think I think other than Cambosis, who really has the most to gain, everyone else is just kind of over it. And that's a shame. Um, someone as talented and who had as much buzz as Lopez did, you know, it's a shame that this has now sort of become just something to get a get done, get a, get it past him, move on, get it over with. Of course, Cambosis gets a say, and the whole damn thing wouldn't have happened. Friendly Healthcare PSA, if Lopez had been vaccinated back in the day, and this was pre-Delta variant, let us all remind ourselves as well. So, you know, this time last year, we were thinking we were in the clear and headed for a full schedule and COVID wasn't going to be a problem for us anymore. And well, I don't need to go any further. Here we are. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'll go to you, Daniel. Um, and yeah, messy is a perfect word to describe this vis-a-vis -vis thriller. Then again, look who's going to appear on that uh, uh, quote unquote event coming um, Saturday. I refuse to, re re I refuse to say who I refuse to uh, mention his name, um, have his name come through my mouth. And again, Gail, as I said during the show, I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> perturbed at that interview, the trolling interview that you email that you did to me because apparently you refuse to suffer alone. But let me move on. Um, speaking of fights in coming up possibly in October, Daniel, it looks like we may have the return of uh, uh, one Mikey Garcia. Um, could be the 16th in Texas. Um, hadn't heard anything about a potential opponent uh, prior to us uh, recording live here. Um, what have you been hearing? Well, not there is an opponent actually. It's 
it was actually an opponent that they wanted uh, to have him for a little bit. It's probably an easy fight. It is a Spaniard by the name. Uh, let me go here. Sandor Martin at 145 pounds. Unfortunately, we do have to discuss why we're having this fight. Because if you mentioned the date, that date was supposed to have a main event that we all were looking forward to. But unfortunately, and this is one of the areas where Mike Coppinger was right, <laughs> but he did report that Chocolatito's camp, mainly his mother, informed the world that he tested positive for COVID. So obviously that fight got scrapped. So now they do this as a last minute thing to main event. But this was a fight that they were they were planning for Mikey for a little bit. Just something of a showcase gimme fight. Get Mikey back up to winning ways. Try to see if you can sell him to other potential opponents. But it is what it is in that one. It, it is what it is. It's going to be a showcase fight. And unfortunately, <laughs> this is replacing the fight we all wanted to see. And judging by everything, this is gonna, it's going to be a fight that we were not going to see this year. Uh, speaking of, of, of uh, um, COVID and its continued impact on the sport, um, the unification showdown at 122 pounds between WBC champion, between uh, uh, Stephen Fulton, who's the WBO champion, WBC champion, Brendan Figueroa, um, has now been uh, postponed after Figueroa has himself uh, tested positive um, um, for uh, uh, COVID-19. And also um, flyweight fight uh, between, um, give me a quick second, um, let me look it up right quick. Uh, shoot, 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 shoot. Kinshiro, Kinshiro. Um, his, uh, in August, let me um, clear here. In August, he was set, he was set to fight, uh, uh, defend his title against mandatory challenger, fellow, a country by the name of uh, Yabuki. Um, Shiro uh, tested positive for the virus in August. Well, news has broken now that the fight has been rescheduled. Um, is going to take place now on September 22nd. Quick, quick turnaround. Apparently, uh, Kinshiro, he tested positive for the virus on the 25th of August. September 23rd, he tested negative. So the doctors gave him the clear. He went on subsequently to get a CAT scan in Tokyo. Um, all things was clear there. Get He got the okay to resume training. His managers and promoters said they want to reschedule this fight as soon as possible so yeah the fight is going to happen september 22nd now in the champion's hometown of kyoto japan uh before we move on to preview some fights here um yeah don't we all don't we all jimmy i'll just leave his comments right there uh for Please everyone to read don't we all jimmy everyone. in the sound of our voices that's for indeed sure. indeed um, um i'm going I to just to be clear, I don't think we were specific. I would assume most people know who are listening that the fight we're not going to get is Estrada, Estrada Chocolatito 3. Um, right. Yeah, so instead we get yet another Mikey Garcia tune-up fight. And half of Mikey Garcia's fights are tune-ups because he stays so long out of the ring, he always has to have a tune-up fight, and then he has a decent fight. And then he is gone for a while, and then we get another tune-up fight, and we get a decent fight. At this point, I think Mr. Gary Russell Jr. is probably doing more competitive fights with a once-a-year decent fight than we've gotten out of Mikey, which is damn frustrating. No, and, and, and doubly frustrating is the fact that this, that, that this contest is going to take uh, place at 145 pounds, uh, 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 the contract of weight. When is Garcia going to get serious and get his butt back down to 140 pounds where he belongs? Well, here's the problem. He ain't a away. Well, here's the thing. Mikey is the most 
talented fighter in the Garcia family. Naturally talented. By student. far. By yes. far. But Mikey's head isn't in it. It is the easiest way for him to make money. He knows it. I think he does enjoy the sport because he does enjoy the, you know, it's the family business. But Mikey's true heart and calling has always been to be in law enforcement. He's made no secret of that. And I think he feels very torn. And if you aren't 100% focused on the sport of boxing, um, it's hard enough when you are all in and then some with all the support you need. But he keeps getting pulled in another direction and it just hasn't helped him. Now, maybe he decided long ago, listen, you know, my boxing career is finite. It's not gonna go forever. It's gonna potentially make me way more money and I can get through it, get to be in my mid thirties, retire and then move on to a second career. And I wish he'd seen it that way, put aside you know, whatever else is distracting him and really ground it out. But he's, he just never had the drive to go with the skills. You know, the few times he's managed to pair those things up and everything's flowing together, you know, we see what the potential was. And I say was because I just don't think we've ever really gotten it. Um, I hope you I wonder if you said this on purpose, Lisa. You said I'm not I'm not impressed with Miley's opponents, but oh well. Did you mean to call him Miley or what you trying to say? <laughs> uh, well, sometimes, sometimes those things you think are mistakes. They're, they're not really was that a, was that a Freudian <laughs> slip? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the sad part of it, but it is the truth. It's it's been the truth when it comes to Mike Garcia ever go by. He wants to be a cop. He's graduated. He's already graduated from a police academy, so it's not like he has to start all over. But this this is the thing that pays the bills. Boxing is something that he just does well, and. He's gonna. I know. Yeah, one forty is the division that he should be at. Is that common sense would dictate? Unfortunately, one forty and is right now being controlled by Top Rank with Josh Taylor, and we know how the relationship with Mikey and Bob went. So you might as well stay in a division that you know that you're somewhat more in control of more having access to even though we kind of know you're only doing it for the money yeah yeah oh she's clarified she said she met, she met mikey <laughs> so so i thought she did that on purpose but yeah it was just a uh, uh yeah she met mikey i'll just say that let's move on and talk about some uh fights that's coming up this weekend um trying to decide where I want to go first. Let's go to the car in Arizona. Um, Tucson and the most controversial fight of the weekend. Um go to you on this one, Daniel. Let's get I want you both of your opinions on this on these two fights I'm about to talk. Let's go to you first on this one, Daniel. Uh, Oscar Valdez, first defense of the WBC belt at 130 pounds against a Brazilian by the name of Concia Cal. Um, if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, my apologies. Uh, Rupson called Concia Cal. This fight had been marred by uh, a positive test for a banned stimulant. Well, the ban, depending on what your drug testing organization you want to speak of. According to VADA, which both men are signed with the VADA testing program, uh, this stimulant, um, I can't remember the name correct exactly, it slips my mind, but this particular stimulant is banned according to vada but the local commission for this fight they are going by wada w-a-d-a and this stimulant is not on their banned substance list the even though both fighters are signed to vada v-a-d-a the local commission local state athletic commission is going by they're ignoring vada's 
uh, uh, test ruling, and there's going by WADA, W-A-D-A, going on with the fight, the WBC, they gave a statement that they're going on to the fight, is going on with the fight as well. Uh, fans, fighters all over has been, have been raising all kinds of hell, whether it's Jamel Herring, whether it's L. Spence, uh, former champion Andre Ward, uh, multitude of boxers have been voicing their displeasure over this move. In spite of it all, uh, Shakur Stevenson, he's had something to say about this as well. Um, in spite of it all, the fight continues. Given that backdrop, your thoughts on the fight? Do you think that Valdez, who is the over one, who is the favorite coming in, do you think that will he will be distracted because of this? Or is it a case of he's just so much better than his opponent that this is a basic, that this should be uh, not easy work, but he should win pretty comfortably? I don't think he's going to be too distracted by the overall side effect of it because as, mu as much as he's done, he's at least a professional in the sense of the fact of what goes on in the ring. So I don't think he's going to be too distracted while he's going to be between the ropes. <clears throat> I do expect him to win and probably win fairly well. The only problem is going to be is the minute that final bell rings, whether it's by knockout or whether it's by decision, he's no longer going to be safe from the confines of inside the ring. There's already a segment of people that are already going to view this as a tainted win. And he should do fairly well in this fight. The only bad part of it is what are you going to do afterwards? Like, because before it was supposed to be the rematch with Burchell, and the goal was to unify against the winner of Jermail Herring versus Shakur Stevenson. Now that's going to be harder to do as far as. How are you going to position it? Because depending on who depending on who wins that fight, if it's Herring, it's going to be more difficult because Herring, we know we know the situation Herring's in, and we know he's not going to take too kindly to the the tactics that are going to be involved. If it's Stevenson, I don't think I don't think his team will care that much. But it's just it's going to be a big mess. I don't think he's going to be distracted by it, but. This has opened a Pandora's box that all parties in the sport need to fix. What say you in terms of this entire entire situation, uh, and, as well as the fight itself, Gail? Well, there were multiple dance partners for Valdez. I mean, Shakur Stevenson was the first obvious choice after he absolutely obliterated Miguel Burchell in February, and that fight still, in my mind, holds up as, in September, the 2021 fight of the year with Valdez taking out Burchell. Stevenson was ringside. He was telling Grandpa Bob, I want that fight. I want that fight. Because Stevenson only holds an interim title. It would make sense. But short time later, the legit WBO champion, Jim L. Herring, absolutely runs through Carl Frampton, a bit of a surprise to a lot of people. So then the discussion turned to Frant to Herring and Stevenson, which they had a lot of time pass and sort of, you know, <laughs> trying to get that one together. It, it is now officially on the schedule news conference held early this morning or maybe it was yesterday morning um, it's going to take place in Atlanta in late October and in all fairness Valdez had a very rough rough fight with Burchell he, he's owed a bit of a tune-up you know easy first def title defense in boxing this is customary accepted you know he did have a blisteringly tough fight earlier this year getting a title defense that is uh, a fair match, but not a challenge, is very acceptable. 
So what was he doing or what were his uh, team doing when they allowed a, a sketchy substance to turn up on a drug test? And if you'll notice my avatar tonight, I am sipping a little herbal tea thinking about how in the world did phentermine pop up from an herbal tea? A lot of people said phentermine, what the hell is that? Well, some of us go back far enough to remember a very dangerous diet craze, of a weight loss drug called fenfen, and it was two different drugs combined that seemed to be getting some miracle weight loss results until it turned out it was extremely dangerous. Well, the fen of fen fen, which was F-E-N slash P-H-E-N, the back half was the fentermine um, and is customarily used for weight loss. Well, that's another head scratcher. Valdez, to my knowledge, has never had any trouble making weight. And this fight, you know, is he backing off in training? I would have a hard time believing that because of the notoriously tough regimen that not only the trainers themselves, but all the fighters uh, as peer pressure put each other through in the Reynoso camp, which is the, you know, camp where Canelo trains um, along with Valdez, Frank Sanchez, and when he's healthy, Ryan Garcia, among others. And, they are very hard on each other. So it's it's hard to fathom any logical reason. Valdez has denied there was a problem. There are conflicting reports about when the drug is considered legal, whose ruling has precedence. Uh, it went to a hearing. It went to the tribal commission who has sanctioned the fight. It went to the WBC. You know all the players involved figured out a way to look the other way and let this fight continue. So many fights have been canceled. COVID is not negotiable. Those, fight gets, those fights are off the schedule. Trace amounts of a drug that people are arguing about. Yeah, the fight's going to go on. But what a shame after the wonderful performance Valdez has ha had against Burchell. Um, and his way up all along the way, some of the fights he's taken, I mean, there's no question about his drive, his heart. Anybody who saw him fight with a broken jaw for half a fight to defeat Scott Quigg will never, ever question Valdez's drive, desire, toughness, skills. But what a bad taste that was so unnecessary. I feel bad for the whole situation, disappointed um, in someone I thought was part of this young guard, although Valdez is at the older end, he is 30. Um, it's just a shame. And he should blow right through uh, his opponent who, who is undefeated. You know, he's got one of these very clean 16 and 0 records, eight knockouts under uh, uh, fighting, you know, absolutely no name to most fans opposition and nobody uh, with a very impressive record. Uh, I don't think he's ever fought anyone who didn't have quite a few losses, you know, perhaps very early in his career. Um, so he's stepping up in opposition, uh, I think a quantum leap would be fair to say. Uh, we'll see where Valdez's head is at, I think more than anything. And, and don't forget everybody, it's on Friday. It's not Saturday night, it's Friday. Most of the major legit boxing cards in the United States are fighting on Friday because Saturday is the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and in deference to uh, everything else going on, I think, for these major cards to move up to Friday was a wise idea. And I will give them credit for that. On the undercard, well, this particular episode is named, uh, y'all sleeping on this one. And the reason I named it 
I, I, I decided to name this particular episode that is because of the fight that's taking place on the undercard of Valdez um, Concia Cal. And that is um, a really slip on world title fight that's taking place between WBO uh, uh, flyweight champion Junto Nakatani, who's putting his, who's making the first defense of that title against former 108 pound champion um, Angel Acosta da uh, Daniel. Um, Nakatani uh, has been drawing rave reviews in his native country of Japan. When he won the belt uh, November last year, he looked terrific. Um, he's facing an Acosta, who is arguably uh, uh, the hardest puncher in the lower weight divisions. Um, Nakatani has uh, visions of, of following his countryman, uh, Naoya Inoue, and making a real name for himself here in the States. Uh, uh, Acosta is fighting uh, for his father-in-law who suddenly passed away uh, last year, right? Um, mm -hmm. Nakatani is more of the boxer puncher who seems to have a way of making fights look easy. You know what Acosta likes to do. He can box, yes. He has skills, yes, but he's known for power in both fists. Uh, on paper, uh, this has the potential to be uh, a fantastic fight uh, one of the best matchups of the year, possibly. Um, it's a I'm looking more. I'm looking forward to this one far more than I'm looking forward to the main event. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I got my eyes on this one for sure. Oh, the, yeah. This was going to be a bar burner. We we're supposed to get this in May, actually. But this was in May in Japan. But the Delta variant made sure we didn't get that in Japan in May. So this is going to be an interesting fight into it because it is a tough crossroads for Nakatani. He does box with it, but he does have power, but Acosta can just flat out hit. And that's going to be a major motivation. He knows what he's going into. He knows that the lower weight divisions, particularly when you get to that range, are going to be a gold mine for him for whoever wins, whether it's Acosta or Nakatani. And I would not be surprised if this goes in the distance. And I hate to say this as a, as a person who wants to see a winner. I would not be surprised if this turns out a draw. Because Nakatani can box really well, and he does have enough power to keep Acosta off for, for a good amount of time. But Acosta is going to get his shots in. And... That is going to be very interesting to see what judges are going to lean towards to it. And like I said, I would not be surprised at all if we wind up having this be a draw. And maybe it would be a little bit too soon, but you never know. Maybe there's a New Year's Eve opening in Tokyo that they might look into. Not with the variant um, and the virus spreading. Uh, um, over there, I mentioned the Ioka fight, his fight over the weekend against um, um, Rodriguez. That was held in an em empty building. Um, their show is still continuing to get uh, canceled and, and pushed back, right? Um, and, you, and you mentioned this fight was going to happen. It's happening here in the States as opposed to Japan because of, of, of COVID-19. So it would be nice, but the way, the, given the situation... In, in Japan right now, I highly doubt it. Uh, Gail, back to this fight, you and your colleagues over at NY Fights uh, kind of had your own uh, panel discussion, if not poll, uh, regarding this fight. Uh, give some uh, details on, on that and what was the results in terms of who folks at NY Fights thought think will win? Well, our colleague Ab uh, Abraham Gonzalez did a survey of a variety of writers, uh, both inside NY Fights and outside. Um, the many followers of this show will know them. Um, and of the 12, the dirty dozen, he questioned, six of us see the fight going for Nakatani, six of us see the fight um, going for Acosta. A true 50-50 fight. And even... For most of us who picked a side, 
we still said, well, I don't know, it could go either way. Here are the factors in Acosta's favor. Here are the factors in Nakatani's favor. Um, so I don't think there was anyone that said, this guy is going to win, hands down, no question, bank on it, bet big. Oh, nobody was saying anything like that. That could not be better news for the fans. This fight among insiders has big expectations. Those of us who love the speed and the crazy action of the smaller weight divisions, we know this one's just going to be on fire. These two guys are going to fight for a 112 pound strap. Costa's the veteran. He's the small, naturally smaller guy coming up in weight. Um, Nakatani is the young gun. He's, he's sort of the Teofimo Lopez, if you will, in this, this circumstance. I wouldn't say Costa's um, quite a Lomachenko, but he is the veteran. And so some people think youth will be served. Others think a veteran with a tough chin will find a way to win. Um, either way, the fans are the guaranteed winners if it's as good as we all predict it's going to be. I, I'm on Team Acosta. I do think the veteran will get it done. We've seen a lot of veterans pull out some great wins recently. And especially, again, with COVID and training being disrupted and the boxing schedule being such a mess, I think in those cases, the veteran who's been there, done that, gone through it, has a little bit of an edge. Um, Acosta knows what it takes. This is a significant step up in competition for Nakatani, it's a great thing for him to do at this point of his career. Hey, he has nothing to lose. He's 23 years old. He's either gonna win or he's going to learn and it's all good for him. And he introduces himself to a much wider audience being on the Stevenson undercard. And they, absolutely, Michael, you're right. Don't you sleep on this, people. These guys could steal the show. Do not show up just for the main event if you're watching tomorrow night. I'm not going to try to call a winner on this one. I'm just going to enjoy the fight for where it is. Um, it hopes it lives up to the hype. I think a key will be Chin, right? Um, when Ocasta lost the title to Elvin Soto, controversial stoppage, I thought it was, but it was ultimately the fact that his chin um, was vulnerable in that fight, particularly towards the left hook. Um, Nakatani, he's such a smooth cat in there uh, so slick in terms of his transition game, offense to defense, vice versa, and he doesn't get hit much. If he shows that he can take the punch of Acosta, he can win because he's the better boxer in most assets, in most facets of the game. A um, little bit better jab, a little bit better head movement, um, and I would argue he's a slightly better inside fighter. At the very least, they're even. Um, and plus, he's the southpaw coming in, so he'll have some advantages there. Um, I just want a good fight. I just want to see the fight is as good as hardcore heads like ourselves think. If it is, it has the chance to be one of the fights of, of, of 2021. And it will, I believe, it will, will steal the show. I want to combine two other fights here into one uh, to start to close things out because I want to get this done, this show done in under 90 minutes. Uh, you mentioned, um, Gail, that uh, the bulk of the action this week is taking place on Friday, uh, September 10th. We could record it here on the 9th, um, live September 9th. Um, Tony Yoka, he's fighting, um, I believe, over in, I believe, over in his native France. Uh, fighting a guy by the name of Milos. Um, Philip Hergovic is fighting on a Dazon card uh, as well. Um, any thoughts on this? I must acknowledge, I don't know that much about the guys Joka and, and Hergovic are fighting, but I get the sense that uh, uh, both big men, Yoga, Yoka and Hergovic, uh, would be the favorite. And I would anticipate, I know this is because. Uh, assuming and get in trouble assuming but i'm gonna I'm do it anyway and kind of be presumptuous and say 
that uh, both men should have a relative easy time. Yeah, these are fights to put these guys on display. Um, the American fight cards are all on Friday, but um, in other venues, uh, no problem with some Saturday fights. So this is going to be in Paris. It's sort of a homecoming for Yoka, who's a Olympic gold medalist. Um, he is fighting a guy who's unbeaten um, on, you know, on uh, uh, his resume, but you know, like a lot of other fights this weekend, including the, the Valdez uh, fight, you know, Peter Milos has fought nobody of Yoka's uh, skill level. Uh, Yoka's, you know, still only had 10 professional fights after his amateur career, 10 fights, eight knockouts. Um, you know, and it, it's a it's a good fight for him to get to fight in front of the fans in Paris. That's really all that's intended is to um, let him plot on a show and send his fans home happy. Uh, 14,000 people are expected to see this fight. And they're fighting at uh, Roland Garros, which is where French Open Tennis Tournament takes place. So um, ESPN Plus is going to air the fight here in the United States. That should be, should be fun to watch. Um, the opponent is from Croatia. And, um, you know, he, he's, you know, the unknown Croatian after another guy we're going to talk about right after this, Philip Hergovic. Um, and, and for good reason. He, he's an okay opponent, but uh, he has also been out of the ring almost two years. So Yoke is there put on a show. And we all know it. Quick word on these two fights, Daniel. Pretty much, Sir Shorty. Hergovich is going to be an interesting fight because he, he's out of the two, he's probably known more as the harder hitter. And we know that Eddie Hearn is trying to build a good stable of opponents for Anthony Joshua should he get past Usyk or for Usyk as well. So... That's going to be an interesting fight. Yoka, it, it is what it is. I think you just have, you may have to put him out there. He's had that suspension. You need to put him out there, showcase him, especially after, granted, it was on a card that was headlined by a clown show. You still had other people making debuts. Daniel Dubois making that American debut. So it's something to put him out there. I don't think they're gonna be. It's gonna be an issue as far as an upset here. Yeah, yeah and, and this and fight and is taking okay. place in Austria, which is awfully interesting. And American fans can see it on DAZN. They have picked it up. Um, both guys are undefeated. Um, and I take it back. This one is also on Friday night. So. Um, or it'll be out Friday afternoon here in the U.S. So you get to see it live on the zone from um, the Werthersee Stadium in Klagenfurt, Austria. Indeed, Sonny Yant was, was supposed to uh, make the first defense of his um, IBF lightweight title against our, our mandatory contender Jason Mama, but that's going to be postponed, I believe, or not. Think another case of COVID. Oh, and, yeah, and yes. Stop us if you've heard this before. Test the positive for COVID. <laughs> so right, right. I don't know if that. I don't know if the entire card has been scratched or what. Uh, I just heard about this just a few hours ago. Um, it has. Anyway, it has not. It is not. It is carrying on. Uh, so Callum Johnson, I think, is going to be fighting on that card. Former light heavyweight, uh, uh, um, world light, world light, world title contender at 175 pounds. Fought uh, Bertie B. Uh, put him down actually in that fight before he ultimately was stopped. Um, so that's a, a card to be pay, to pay attention towards. Uh, I think it's a BT Sport Frank Warren um, um, card. And I think on that note, I think we're going to start to shut things down. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us in the live chat. Um, I want to thank Lisa. Um, want to thank Jimmy. Uh, Sean, as always, he's here. Uh, uh, what you need as well as I'm missing someone. I'm missing someone. Sam, not Sean, but uh, I'm missing Lee. Lee, Lee, how can I miss Lee? Lee, Lee, Lee uh, with his yeah. boxing, with his boxing, boxing nerd them. So yeah, uh, him as well. I want to thank everybody 
in in the chat for their comments and their questions uh please make sure to hit that like button if you did not do so please make sure to click the subscribe button and follow us as well um if you're checking out the show on the podcast realm um be it spotify be it apple podcast be it anchor be it google podcast um, and all other platforms uh podcast platforms make sure to follow us as well as well as well there uh leave a review for us on apple podcast uh, that helps the overall algorithms of the show a five-star review will get read um i'm going around the panel here uh first and begin the show ladies first going to end the show ladies first uh gail for community digital news um ny flights the falcon rally group for those who want to talk to sweet science let the folks know where they can hit you up you can find me uh, with my regular coverage column about ready to post the Valdez Comcial lineup at Communities Digital News, and that is com, C O M M Digi, D I G I News, com, digi news.com. And then my opinion based column, Falcon Talk. Thank you, Woodsy as on new new york fights.com and fights.com and the difference is on ny fights that's the one where i get to swear <laughs> indeed indeed and um i see your comments lisa a uh, bit of an update on the ladies love boxing uh, episode the latest rendition the plan is to do it the week of fury and wilder trilogy i just, just want to give folks an update on that uh please make sure to check that out sisters i saw you i see you in the chat right now lisa I'm going to go to you, Daniel, for those who want to talk uh, the sweet science, for those who want to talk the NBA, especially when it comes to the Miami Heat, for those who want to talk pro wrestling. And, um, yeah, there was quite a thread between you and um, Ideation and um, Ain't Animal uh, recapping or discussing uh, uh, the AEW uh, pay-per-view show. Um, and hang on after the show. Uh, I got a comment about that, Daniel. Uh, anyway, for those who want to talk about that, boxing, uh, uh NBA, specifically the Miami Heat, pro wrestling. Um, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, folks, you can find me on Twitter, Rockers99, R-A-W-K-U-Z-99. Uh, we're going to have to take the show on f- Sunday because there's scheduling conflicts here. And I was thinking to discuss that area, but definitely catch in there. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was a threat, wasn't it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, Lochos, Lochos bros. That's all I got to say about that. Um, for those who want to talk, uh, uh, you boxing, um, music, fitness, you know what it is. Uh, on Twitter, you know what it is with me, brother JR at brother JR76. Um, as I said to begin the show, um, if you want to check out all things regarding the show, the website is the place to go to. Um, p4pboxerreport.com just check out the website to find out all links of where to find us all over the podcast realm um where to find the show on 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 social out, outlets like facebook twitter ig and whatnot where you can donate the link to my online coaching page as well as where you want to email us if you want to email us p4pboxing at p4pboxerreport.com the next episode because the Fulton Figueroa camp fight was canceled. Uh, they kind of mixed, they kind of messed things up for us. Uh, so um, to adjust, I may not do a show next week because the week of the 18th is not much going on. Yes, there's a women's uh, world title bio, about um, at 115 pounds, but other than that, not much happening. So I may take next week off and just do a full, full uh, preview of the fight between Joshua and Usek on the 25th and just discuss that entire card. Um, I'll let you know via Pound for Pound Boxer Report um, Twitter page. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody here um, in the live chat. Uh, again, Lisa, uh, Philip, um, What You Need, um, Jimmy, Lee, Sean, thank you for your comments and your questions. Um, for Gail, for Daniel, um, I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode 338 of the show. Everyone have a good evening. Uh, good night.